Good evening, you all. Very welcome to the October meeting of the LGBT History Club, which is a collaboration between the LGBT Heritage Project and the Linen Hall Library. And our LGBT Heritage Project is uh, funded by the Lottery uh, Heritage Fund and um, is led by Here and I in collaboration with um, the Rainbow Project and Cara Friend. And for tonight's um, uh, talk, I'm delighted to um, have obtained as a speaker um, Sarah Phillips. And uh, Sarah is um, a trans and intersex activist working in, in, in Ireland, but has um, been involved in trans activism for over 25 years. And she's uh, currently in her third term as chair of the board of director of Ireland's national trans organization, Transgender Equality Network Ireland, Kenny. But Tar Sarah has also been um, a collector and archivist and historian of Irish trans history and founder of the Irish Trans Archive. And uh, it's in that capacity that uh, we are delighted to have her um, as our speaker this month because uh, Within LGBT history, there's um, you know less known about 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 uh, uh, trans history, and Sarah uh, will talk to us for about thirty five minutes, um, telling most of us uh, many things that that, that um, we had no idea about, <laughs> and after that we'll have a um, question and answer uh, session, and you may wish to use the chat facility to uh, put your questions either during the uh, talk or um, afterwards. So I'll now hand you over to Sarah Phillips and we might give her a virtual round of applause. Over to you, Sarah. Uh, thanks, Richard. Um, and first of all, thank you everybody for, first of all, Richard, thank you for the invitation uh, for this evening. It's a great opportunity uh, to share with you some of the, uh, I suppose, multitude of stories that, that I've come across over the years uh, about trans history specifically in Ireland. And I'm actually surprised at the, the amount of people who've turned out because we don't always get this amount of people uh, turning up for listening to trans history. Um, hopefully tonight's chat will give you a sense of um, how trans uh, community, how the trans community has come across over the last 40 years, as well, specifically between the 70s and 90s, um, which we're going to focus on tonight. I tend to focus mostly on Southern Ireland, although a lot of um, my kind of research crosses that border, as I mentioned to Richard earlier in the week. Also, you cannot take uh, trans rights or trans issues the same way as you can't with the rest of the LGB uh, community. You cannot take those um, in context of their on their own, you have to consider them globally uh, or within say the wider UK, Ireland context. So there are a number of things that I will con constantly touch on around that, but generally I'm going to be talking about Southern Ireland, but I do, from time to time I'll talk about Northern Ireland as well. Um, however, also when we're talking about discussing trans rights and the advancement of trans people through those early years, it is important that we remember that also language was very different back then. Uh, you know, words like transvestite, transsexual, um, words like non-binary were really not even in the, um, within the language. Um, so we can't really talk about trans history dynamics without considering those two separate cohorts, their interactions, and also how trans people fitted into the wider uh, gay community, LGBT community either. Um, so it's important to remember that all of these things must be taken in context. And lastly, a lot of the things that I find when you're researching trans stories is that for the best part, it's very difficult to try and find trans men within those stories. You will from time to time over maybe 200, 300 years ago, which is quite another part of my research and then maybe as another just good talk at some other point but 
for the latter years, you know, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, trans men are basically invisible. Um, so it is important that sometimes that, that while I will touch on one or two people, it is very much important. This tends to be a, uh, a female history to a certain degree. Um, it's also, I suppose, we don't have a lot of time to consider the social history that these stories um, are centered in. So at some point, that's a whole other kind of piece of research. But I, I'd like to start just this evening, probably just in to touch on the 1960s, because global conversations around being transgender were starting to filter into the press at that point, and especially in the USA and the UK, stories like, actually, I'm going to share my screen um, as we had suggested we would. Is that okay, Richard? Okay. So stories like Christine Jorgensen, uh, Roberta Kell, can everyone see that? Yeah? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, we can see that. Great. So stories like Christina Jorgensen, Roberta Kell, um, Michael Dillon, these stories um, were starting to filter into the, the both the British press and the US press. So it's very much that these conversations were starting to happen. You know, April Ashley's marriage in 1962 to Arthur Corbett was celebrated um, within the British press. Uh, however, by the time she gets to 1969, um, you know, the press are questioning whether she can be considered a woman. Um, Michael Dillon, um, you know, who had transitioned in the 40s and first man to have ever had um, surgery, by again the early 50s is being hounded by the Daily Express out of uh, Ireland and ends up in Tibet in the early 60s as a monk and, and dies there very early on. So it's very much a... I think a situation that if you are willing to engage with the press at the time, you will get a positive story. If you are not willing to engage with the press, actually you'll end up having a negative story. So it's an interesting kind of set of parameters that we see very early on when trans issues and trans stories start to come into, into um, both the UK and the US uh, newspapers. However, by the summer of 1965, there are four individuals, four trans individuals, have joined an organization which was started by Virginia Prince uh, in the States, based in the States, uh, called Phi, Phi, Phi P. Ellison Epsilon, which is standing for Full Personality Expression. Um, they start a UK-based uh, chapter of that, which they call the Beaumont Society. Um, the Beaumont Society, many of you may have already heard, it's still going today. It is formed by four individuals, Alice Purnell, Alga Campbell, Giselle, who's an American uh, living in Europe, and Sylvia. Um, and they started as very much a secret society, but it is at that point very inclusive of both what are known at that stage, transsexuals and transvestites. Alga Campbell, who is from Dublin, uh, was appointed the president and held that position for, I think it was nearly eight years, if I remember correctly. But after the initial meeting, there was a full meeting uh, of 12 individuals held in 1966 in Southampton. It's important to understand that Alga Campbell is living in Dublin at the time this uh, organization is formed. And it very much speaks to the sense that specifically in Ireland, and, and we've got to remember this is very much Catholic Ireland at that stage, Southern Ireland anyway, um, people felt the need to leave the country in order to uh, present the, as their uh, true gender. The society it's, at the time was founded when there was very little knowledge around trans people or even any real tolerance from public um, the law or police, because very much, don't forget, being homosexual at that point on all parts of the island uh, was still uh, criminalized, as it was in the UK at that stage. Um, so those very starting tentative steps to try and bring some, some sort of community together starts to grow through that Bowman society. 
By the early 70s, there are many Irish people that are attending the Bowman Society events and an Irish chapter uh, was formed. Um, basically, if you were tra being trans and traveling to the UK, you needed obviously have some sort of means in order to be able to travel at that point back and forward for weekends or, or trips, whatever. But if you were looking for somebody who was looking to transition, you more or less left Ireland. You either headed for the UK, the US or Australia to find an opportunity to be able to transition. Uh, the Beaumont Society uh, for held its first annual conference in Leeds in 1974, which brought together quite a number of activists across the two islands. Um, and this was the starting point for quite a lot of um, both cross-border relationships and uh, you know, across the Irish Sea. Um, out of that chapter, Irish chapter, uh, the Friends of Eon were formed, um, which was the first Irish organization um, in 1978. Uh, there had been some conversations at the time uh, between some Northern Irish transsexuals, transvestites meeting in informal meetings from about the mid 70s, uh, first in Ballygown and then later in University Street in Belfast before moving to Cara Friend actually uh, in the mid 70s. And, but the first actual organization on the island to form was very much the Friends of Ian. And, and recently, talking to one of the founding members of, of um, that organization, Claire Farrell, uh, for an article for the archive, which is soon to be published in Gay Community News in Dublin, uh, Claire was explaining how the Friends of Ian was formed. It was that both herself and Lola Mar had continually traveled back and forward to London and Manchester for Beaumont events but were actually very despondent that nothing was happening in Ireland in between these events. And they had got together and decided to do something about that um, and try and form an organization that would uh, provide some social outlets at minimum and then hopefully some sort of activism around uh, trans rights or trans uh, inclusion um, and acceptance. It's an interesting point because at that time in 1978, it was between two moments within uh, Irish television. In 1975, uh, April Ashley, who I mentioned earlier, appears on RTE, The Late Late Show. Um, and the, the reception she receives from Gay Byrne, the host at the time, is not only very respectful and dignified, but actually in the press the next day, she actually gets a really good write-up. Like one of the, the newspapers mentions, um, uh, sorry, one of the newspapers mentions, um, you know, perhaps the most impressive thing on television over the past week was a woman on The Late Late Show who had made a sex change. She had great dignity and courage, and she made a good cause for humanity of whatever sex without trying to hammer home any points. She was an outstanding example of an in integrated person. Gay Byrne interviewed her with a hint of snigger in his voice, but few could have managed so well, but at least he behaved himself, which is quite an interesting review. It's interesting that by four years later in 1979, when a member of the Friends of Ian appears on the same program, there is outrage. Leslie Quelch, the, the then president of the Irish League of Decency, is very critical of the, of the program next day, saying that this individual should not have been allowed to go on, accusing RTE of using public money to bring this unfortunate individual onto the late, late show and advertise his wares. I think it's probably a case of too, clo too close to home for Catholic Ireland, somehow or other. But it very much speaks to the nature of the 1970s because we have everything from uh, respectful reports throughout the press. We have negative reports, depending on who's writing it, depending on how the trans person engages, and also depending on uh, the behavior of an individual, say, on the, in, if, if they're on the, the uh, television, etc. Something else that occurs with the Friends of Ian very early on is, is that 
during the late 1970s, uh, the gay community in Dublin uh, opened up what is their community centre, the Hirschfield Centre. And the organisers at the time go out of their way to ensure both gay men and lesbians can avail of the resource. There's some questions around how all that happens, but I, I think the more, the most important part of this is they also reach out to the newly formed Friends of Ian um, to see would they be willing to use the resource um, for their meetings. And after a meeting is set up with the Friends of Ian committee to discuss the possibility of the Friends using the centre, they decide to take the conversation away and discuss it at their own uh, group and then revert back to the uh, Hirschfield Centre committee and say, look, no thanks, but thanks for the offer. And, and that's it. It's, it actually takes nearly 40 years later to find out why, because what actually occurs is that there's a decision made by the committee at the time uh, that actually they did not want to be associated, that's the Friends of Ian, did not want to be associated with those criminals. And you have to kind of look at what we then talk about um, the trans community at that stage. The majority of the Friends of Ian at that point were very much transvestites rather than transsexuals. And they are predominantly uh, middle-aged, middle-class, uh, married men, straight men. And therefore they have this uh, understanding that they, they don't want to be, have any association with gay people and therefore in, in uh, association with criminals. And as I said earlier, remember we're still at that point, uh, Ireland, it's still, in Ireland, it's still criminal to be a homosexual. But things start to move a little bit as we get towards the eighties. Um, you know, the uh, Friends of Ian started a helpline. This is where Dan comes in and I'll wave to Dan there, I think uh, earlier and say hi, because I know Dan has provided the archive with quite a lot of information over the, the early days, as has Claire. Um, the, the Friends of Ian start a helpline. It's, off, it's answered from the office of Claire Farrell's uh, office. Uh, they reach out, they have radio documentaries, they go on the Pat Kenny show at that point. And also they have a number of forays into print media, trying to increase knowledge, trying to uh, explain about trans people's existence in Ireland, that, that we did exist, albeit in, a, in, in very much in the shadows. But in 1980, uh, RTE decides to broadcast an interview with Claire Farrell, who was then the president of the Friends of Ian. And on the 19th of August, um, Sorry, I'm going the wrong way here. I keep forgetting that this thing is up, so my apologies. Um, so they, they broadcast uh, a program which is known as Summer House, which is, uh, follows Claire Farrell around the local shopping centre in a very voyeuristic way, I have to say, but also, and watches the reaction of passers-by, but also interviews Claire about being transsexual in Ireland at that day. And throughout the interview, Claire continues in a very respectful way to explain what it means for her and what it means to be transsexual or trans in any shape or form in Ireland in 1980. Anya um, uh, also goes and joins uh, the members uh, of the Friends of Ian in the Parliament Inn for a meeting and speaks to other members. I have, if anybody wants it, there's a link here down the bottom of my um, screenshot there of RTE archives. You can actually watch that. It's about 20 minutes long if anyone wants to have a look at it. It's really interesting um, piece of history to watch at the time. Um, and Claire explained that, you know, uh, at the time in, in the documentary and even to myself afterwards that the Friends of Ian was very much a social club. They were trying to do a certain amount of activism. They were trying to reach out uh, to the newspapers, to the, the radio, etc., to try and get some recognition for the work they were doing. But generally, socially, they would run uh, an evening called Lola's. In fact, there's quite a funny um, advertisement in Dublin at the time, which basically advertised for Lola's, come dressed if you wish, um, which kind of, I suppose, is uh, kind of funny 
to think about it, but at the time in 1980s with no other information other than that, that this meeting was on and to contact the friends of Ian for more information. Um, but people would go, sometimes they would come dressed as females, they would bring their partner, the others would bring their clothes and get changed in the venue um, and, and obviously, um, you know, do their makeup, etc., like that. And um, you'll also notice, as I said earlier, trans men are not really catered for. In fact, for the best part, trans women at that point hadn't really even known of their existence. The assumption is that there are trans men, but you're not finding them out at this stage. Uh, you will see some media reports, although they don't filter back into the Irish media uh, a lot, uh, coming out of the States, for instance, around trans men stories, trans male stories, but um, you don't find them in Irish uh, newspapers, etc. The Friends of Ian also had visits from the local guard inspector, not from a, for a bad reason. Um, he basically came and gave lectures to rank and he gave lectures to rank and file about trans people uh, based, based on what he could learn from the Friends of Ian. Um, and he, he really became a great friend of the group so that actually some of them actually had his private phone number in case they ever had a problem with the Gardaí, which is, you know, with trouble on the streets, etc., cetera, or, or being stopped, etc., cetera, while, while uh, presenting as their themselves. So it's an interesting period of time that there's this dynamic um, going on both between the Gardaí, who are on one hand uh, behaving in a particular way legally, and then on the other hand, socially, they are very much supportive of the, the trans community. There, there's other very many important developments throughout the 80s, uh, you know, in a fight, and this is, we must remember this, that as I said earlier, the, the uh, influence of what's happening in the UK on Ireland has a huge effect. If we see everything that they, as we, as we do today, um, everything that is, is on the TV and the news and the documentaries. And in the early 1980s, in five hour long film documentaries, which were aired in BBC Two called A Change of Sex, Julia Grant's story uh, basically rips the nation. Nearly nine million viewers watched the first ep episode. And by in 1979, and by 1982, Julia's surgery is actually broadcast on BBC Two in all its gory detail, if you want, or glorious detail. Um, but these stories are not always happy endings like Gloria's, because, you know, again, also in 1980, the Belfast Telegraph reports on the death of a Belfast woman, Wilma Creeth, um, on the surgery table in Leeds. Um, you know, and, and uh, Wilma was working in Belfast as a bus driver, um, but it clearly shows that both gender reassignment surgeries at that time in 1980 were still both dangerous and experimental. Um, so it's, it's crucial to we must center everything at that point in time. Um, there's a number of other developments, um, you know, by 1984, and, and this kind of spans the, the 70s, mid 70s into the 80s. Uh, Dr. Richard Eakin in the University of Ulster has been doing some research, a lot of research um, around uh, trans stories, around trans histories, and starts the Transgender Archive, which is based in the U University of Ulster, which is still available online now in the University of Victoria. Um, and that, that provides, a huge resource that um, identifying the stories, the information, the evidence, the existence of trans people throughout not only the UK, and it's very much a specifically a UK based archive, but there is touching bits and pieces uh, coming from Southern Ireland or from the States or rest around the rest of the world. Um, but it still creates this sense that there is a lot more individuals out there. There's a lot more uh, of a community starting to grow both globally in the UK and again in Ireland. Um, and that, that, is, that continues to be a really important resource even to today. In 1980, uh, the Friends of Ian actually become really um, quite uh, uh, 
I suppose, empowered. They decide to take over this wonderful house, uh, Killer Cascan House, um, and decide to have a weekend away and put nearly 40 odd individuals, trans people, um, in this in for the weekend and and have various different programs and various different conversations but it's basically a social weekend um, but you see the, the stems of what be starting to become a community rather than just these dispersed individuals um, and yet for lots of ways the trans community is still very dispersed across the the total of the island by the 1990s northern ireland's um, uh, has has the wonderful um, formation of the Belfast Butterfly Club in there in September ninety one. Um, it's formally constituted um, and and very much has been and still is going today. It's been a huge uh, resource for the trans community both north and south um, over the years. I know uh, back in the nineties when I came out myself first, uh, you know it was somewhere that I I visited a lot of the Belfast Butterfly Club visited a number of the clubs in Dublin at that stage and, and there was quite a, a back and forward conversation about what was happening on both sides of the island. Um, but and also during the 1980s we start to see within the European Union a change in conversation so as you'll see on the piece that I've put up there at the end of 1989 uh, people who have sex changes should not face discrimination the European Parliament is starting to um, talk about these issues and we're starting to see a number in the same way as gay rights are starting to be brought towards the European Court of Human Rights. The European Parliament is starting to talk about these issues as well and specifically trans rights as much as just uh, gay rights. Um, However, we do see again that continuation of negative stories in the press. You see things like this, you know, why I went on the game, I want a sex change, I want to marry a man, you know, why, and I'm, I'm trying to raise money to get surgery because there is no uh, process, there is no support, there is no um, uh, pathway for healthcare at that point. And, and consistently you see these types of articles, not just in the Sunday world, which this was in, but in the mainstream press, like the, the Irish Independent and the Irish Times as well. Um, you also see glorified organ or uh, media around, this is uh, Rebecca de Havilland as, as she's known now, but somebody who had a very high uh, profile in Ireland at the time. And, and again is, there's a series of uh, press reports across the late 80s and early 90s um, about Rebecca because Rebecca engages quite a lot in order to try and uh, have some control over her own story. Um, by the 1990s, you know, Dublin was becoming, starting to become more open. The Celtic Tiger had opened up. Um, you know, a societal sense that kind of anything goes. I know this is kind of where I come out at that point. Um, you know, trans people, predominantly cross-dressers, were a constant fixture of Dublin nightlife, especially on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. You know, dressing services and trans clubs started to opening up. Uh, there were more gay bars opening up where we had obviously places to go. Um, one particular uh, trans club, which is quite a large space um, on um, just off Liffey Street it was called Amanda Barry's. Um, you know that that was kind of I know my own first steps into into the trans community back in 1992, but it hosted everything from uh, you know trans nights specifically, cross dressing nights, but also uh, open nights. It also held, you know, HIV fundraisers. It held various different get-togethers, not just for the trans community, but also across the whole LGBT community. Um, at one particular HIV um, fundraiser, uh, I found myself the sub my own self the subject of a, a what do you call it a headline in the in the Evening Herald: Men in dresses. And you'll see the piece to the right hand side or my right hand side. Um, if you don't mind, I'll read it. The atmosphere is the heady mix of subdued lightning, French perfume and cigarette smoke. Sarah adjusts her black silver lame jacket and steps from one high heel foot to another. 
her car has just been broken into near the city centre club where she's socialising with her friends and she's clearly upset. It's only when Sarah turns and speaks that you would really know the voice is unmistakably that of a man. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, that's the sort of kind of conversation and the kind of reporting that had it. I had, did have slight anecdote. I did have the opportunity to speak to the actual reporter back about four years ago. Uh, I found myself on a TV program as she was hosting the Vincent Brown show and, and brought up the point about the head, the horrible headline, um, et cetera. And uh, while she did apologize, um, I don't necessarily think the apology was, was totally true or uh, in, in the right, uh, in the right way. But anyway, um, so just going back, stepping away from myself, as I say, there's a lot of things happening at that stage, uh, specifically in Dublin and in Belfast. You know, we, we see the shop transformation open up in Belfast. Uh, there are consistent um, um, uh, protests outside. Um, there is an acceptance that this is, this is not going to happen in Belfast. The one in Dublin opens up uh, in mid-1990s. It also has protests from the Legion of Mary and eventually both uh, shops close. Um, but we also see, uh, you know, a number of different things happening in trans rights all at the same time. So I mentioned Dr. Lydia Foy and in 1993, Dr. Foy decides to write to uh, the Registrar uh, of Births looking to get her um, birth certificate changed and to recognize her gender as it was then. Um, the, as you'll see from the, the post on the, on the screenshot, you will see that the Registrar General, General writes back and says that there is no way they can amend it, but they will um, consider it. It takes 22 years, as we probably most of you know, to actually get it get this to, to change, but I'm not going to focus on that. What is interesting to know is that there are other things going on at the same time, but by individuals within the trans community. And first of all, there is, there's work going on in around the acceptance um, of people in college, uh, people who are fighting for to get their degrees and their leaving cert changed to their, their current gender. Um, and to be recognized in that gender. There is work going on around a concerted campaign undertaken by two individuals, Heather and Lauren, to get the passport changed so that you could get your passport corrected in your, in your true gender. But what is actually interesting, all of these different pieces of work are going on in a separate manner. They're all being uh, done by individuals at a time. And actually what's interesting is that at the same time that all these things are going on, one particular individual actually gets her passport in October 1992 without any issue, just actually goes in and applies for it, has a chat with the passport office and they issue it randomly. Um, a real Irish solution to an Irish problem, I suppose. But it's weird because actually what most people don't realize is that Dr. Foy wasn't actually looking for her birth certificate to be changed. What she was actually looking for was documentation that recognized her for who she was. And the, she had been told by the legal uh, people in FLAC in the free legal uh, advice centers that the only way she could do that was by getting her birth cert changed because the birth cert was the fundamental document of identity in Irish, in Ireland. So that's why she takes up the case of looking for her birth cert certificate to be changed. It's interesting if she had realized that she could have actually got her passport changed, she may never have taken that case we may never have gender recognition in Southern Ireland um, because of that fact. And again, it is years later, in fact, it was this year in July when I became aware that this individual had actually got her passport just purely by accident, having a conversation about trans history. Um, you know, and I, and I mentioned, or I, I noticed Hannah here earlier, you know, I was talking this to Hannah about this earlier uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, just by pure coincidence, meeting this individual, um, Anya Keenan, about talking about trans uh, rights and trans history in the early 90s. 
that actually says, actually, guess what? I've got a, a passport here. Maybe this is be interested to you. And then when you start looking at the dates, the dates actually predate uh, Dr. Foy's legal cases or, or even applications. It also predates uh, Heather and Lauren's campaigns in the mid-1990s, etc. So the trans community is very, very disparate. However, what starts to happen is that in the mid-90s, everybody starts to come together. People start to connect. There's more social events. There's more uh, individuals looking to fight for, uh, to get surgeries paid for, etc. And you'll see uh, some of the, the, the very different uh, media press reports at the time, you know, uh, sex chains ops co you know, cost the taxpayer 20. And there's uproar in a lot of cases. You get the odd uh, letter from, uh, into the newspaper letters page, you know, kind of saying that these things are should be done, but very rarely do you get a report that is positive towards um, gender reassignment surgeries. But what happens is in, these individuals start reaching out to each other. How did you get yours funding? How did I get, you know, and all of these things start to happen. Uh, St. Patrick Dunn's or St. Patrick's um, in Dublin starts to create, um, you know, support groups around those people who are looking for medical care and people start to connect. However, one thing that I, I don't want to, and I'm, I'm quite conscious of the time here just for the moment, um, is that during the mid nineties, there is a conference that is held on lesbian lives. And, and I don't want to finish this piece. And this is, we've I've touched on lots of little different things and there's so much more to talk about. But lesbian lives conferences, in Dublin is one of the main reasons I believe why both feminist and lesbian communities in Ireland are now inclusive of trans women and supportive of the trans community in general. And we see quite a backlash of what's going on in the UK and we see even it's now starting to filter in even in the last couple of days um, into Ireland um, around you know, trying to reverse the gender recognition legislation. And at that, me, at that uh, Lesbian Lives conference in mid-1990s, a, a trans woman is asked to leave a workshop. And there is uproar, because actually the majority of people at the conference actually are supportive of the trans woman. And it's only in a small number of uh, individuals who are looking for her removal. And through the conversations that occur at that conference, and also then a number of weeks, maybe months later, from meetings that were convened by Alva Smith, um, that actually the inclusion of trans women and the acceptance of trans women in women's spaces and sp specifically feminism and specifically um, uh, lesbian circles and women's spaces is very much accepted and put forward as being part, we are part of that community. And this decision that was positive in these discussions means that that continues on over the next 20, 25 years through the varying different conversations that occur both as, as new and young uh, lesbians and feminists come through that program or through those you know, gender programs, et cetera. So it's very critical that the early 1990s with all of these um, legal cases, all of this activism and rights all starts to take fold from what had been a social community for the previous 10 to 15 years. And I, even it takes another 10 years before the community starts to really come together, form an organization and start to fight for our own rights, etc. But hopefully that gives you some little bit of an overview um, of, of kind of the birth of trans rights and trans community specifically in Ireland over the last, over those kind of 30 odd years. There are so many more things I can talk about, but uh, I might just leave it there for the moment. I know I'm over my 35 minutes at this point. Um, and I'm, I'm used to people kind of going, no, you're finished now, Sarah. So it's a rarity that I'm finishing myself. Sarah, we'll pause there, but only for the purpose of, um, allowing people to submit questions on the chat um, is probably the easiest way or um, they can also um, communicate 
audio, but let's try some chat first. Just want to thank you for um, a fascinating um, kind of was introduction and overview. And uh, clearly there is um, a lot more for you to share and that we can have you back at a, a future date. But um, let's um, see um, if anyone has a question that they can either write uh, in. Sorry, Richard. Yep. Sorry, just um, if I may ask a question, um, and it's just easier to kind of yep. speak it rather than type it. So, Sarah, thank you very much, and it was really interesting. Um, and I was particularly interested, I mean, you and I have discussed the Lesbian Lives Conference, and it's great to hear that brought into it. Um, and I, I would agree that it, it did an awful lot in terms of the wider community and bringing the kind of trans and lesbian and feminist communities together. But I'm interested, and I don't know if you can, you can speak to this or maybe others, um, the more social kind of lesbian uh, spaces, such as the kind of I know I, 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 I'm not party to either groups or, or other social groups, but I know that there has been issues around, certainly with the camps, around trans women participating in, in, in the women's camps. And I, I, I think generally the broader society, broader community has, that there is a kind of an integration between the trans community, but socially, can you speak? Um, kind of acceptance of trans people and specifically trans women in, in lesbian and feminist spaces. Uh, that is a very large generalization, I think, on my part, but because there are issues um, from time to time and have been issues from time to time, but what you tend to find in a lot of cases, they are centered around individuals or centered around smaller cliques about people specifically that, that you have issues with. I mean, I, I know for argument's sake, you know, and, and I remember speaking to somebody uh, about this not long ago, but the, you know, my own experience back in 2000 and, or in 1994, 95, um, I used to go to a lesbian night in Dublin. I won't say where because then it'll identify the people involved. Um, but I, I did go to, used to go to a lesbian night. For the best part, I went on my own. Um, you know, I didn't really know anybody. It was a night out for me. Um, and, and I just went along for somewhere to go. But on one particular occasion, I, I found a, a situation where, as I had just got in through the doors, a trans woman was being stopped and being told, you know, we don't want your kind of person here. Um, at which point, you know, if anybody knows me, I wasn't going to keep my mouth shut at that stage where I had been keeping my mouth shut beforehand. And it, it transpired, then I got thrown out. Um, and, and I wasn't aware of that because, you know, and I, I've spoken to people who used to go to that, that event uh, at the time and they, they were not aware of this was the sort of kind of attitude at the door that if you were very obviously trans, then you weren't getting in the door and you weren't being allowed in. Obviously, at that point, I was probably being very lucky in the sense that they weren't reading me as trans and therefore I was getting through the door. I think similarly, and, and this, this prevails even up to this day. I mean, I know last year in 2019, um, at Cork Pride, there was a women's event on the Friday night, and there was quite a lot of negativity in, again, specifically around two individuals at the time, um, you know, about the fact that there, were, there was a trans woman at that particular event. And luckily enough, a lot of the women at, the, you know, at that event knew this trans woman she's very well known um she's been around a long time she's been fighting for trans rights for a long time as well and they stood up for her and said look this is you cannot we do not accept this we're not willing to talk about it so in my experience as long as i've been around and around and again like in lesbian circles you know i've found that it tends to be small pockets of either individuals or you know individuals on the, their own that you tend to find it. Um, but I think the, and that's why I think it's still okay to generalize because I think the majority of 
lesbian events still is very are very inclusive of trans women um, specifically and of the trans community as a whole. Thanks, Sarah. I've got a, a two questions here on the chat. Um, one is from um, Karen McShane, who says, excellent insight into the history of trans people in Ireland. But she asks, um, if you could change anything today, what would it be? Uh, <laughs> um, what could I be? What could it be? What could it be? Um, I suppose that the, the problem is, is there's so many things. Um, I, I usually try to incorporate all of the various different things that are still outstanding for trans people. So I would go back and start with education, 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 because it prevails across every single facet of the things that we need. So if you look at healthcare, there is even within the medical system, there is, an, there is a lack of understanding about trans people. So therefore education there. Legal gender recognition in Ireland, Southern Ireland is not inclusive. And in Northern Ireland, it is, it is just downright disrespectful because it's a UK based system. Um, and, and I think that again, doesn't speak to the nature of what it means to be able to be recognized for yourself. And I was doing a talk or a thing, recording a thing today that, that you know about the, you cannot, I can, it's very hard to explain what it means, you know, the validation for me, say even me or any of us, uh, to be given the dignity and respect for my decision, for me to say, this is me and the government accepts it. This state accepts it. They don't, I don't have to ask anybody else's permission for it. And, and that, is, that is huge, that is massive. So I think including people with non-binary identities and including under 16s and intersex people is crucial. But again, it goes back to education, education, education for the body politic to understand why this is really important. Um, and then again, generally across society, you know, I think people learning about trans people from a very early age, you know, to understand that we exist, that we're not something unusual, that we're not somebody, we, we've lived our lives the same way as the gay community have, you know, in the shadows. We're probably 20, 25 years behind the rest of the community. Um, still trying to get social acceptance. And, you know, while people think sometimes that fight sometimes is also within our own community, never mind, um, you know, in general society, you know, if we think that, that you know, say in Southern Ireland, in, in like in the Republic, that, you know, the way that great event of marriage equality, and yes, during that process, trans people were being silenced. You know, these things are not well known but you know there was a concerted effort not to make to make sure the trans people were not fourth right and center in those discussions because it would confuse Middle Ireland. It would confuse uh, what what it meant to be gay in Ireland. And and these and these are and, and you know if we had enough time, I can list out the different places and times we we um, we were silenced. I mean, perfect example: the last LGBT noise. Um, uh, camp or uh, protest a week before the um, before the referendum, you know, uh, Claire Farrell, who I've mentioned a number of times here, forty years an activist, um, was about to stand on the stage and talk why marriage equality was important for the trans community because there was a divorce clause within the gender recon proposed gender recognition act, and yes there was a concerted effort to try and get LGBT noise to remove her from the stage, the, like the week coming up to it, to make sure the trans voices were not being heard in the conversation because they didn't want to confuse the general public about this narrative. So there's a huge amount of work still to be done. And that's why I keep going back, education, education, education. Great, Sarah, I've got quite a few questions here, so I want to uh, try and get through them. One from Philip Rivers, who's doing a, a PhD on trans or history in Northern Ireland. And he asks, are you aware of any cases or anecdotes about the influence of the troubles or sectarianism or paramilitarism and the trans experience in Northern Ireland? Yeah, I, I do have quite a lot of them. Um, in fact, well, there, a lot of them are anecdotes, but, uh, and, and if Philip wants to reach out to me, I can share them. I'd be happy to share them. In fact, what you tend to find, 
again with the trans community and and like if you look at my byline i i call myself a middle aged punk because that's exactly what i am i'm middle aged punk i'm i'm probably a lot older than middle aged now but anyway um you know i came through the punk era it's very much a, a, a like my music kind of taste and and you find within that that kind of uh music genre kind of across divide in the troubles like they don't like it they make everybody mixes it's very much the same in trans circles in around that period of time you get people coming from both sides uh of the divide um and in in those conversations um so yeah i mean i can i can share whatever any information i have here so what we'll do is that you may wish to post your email address into the chat yeah sorry um, i did have it on the very end of my share, if you can see it there, irishtransarchive at gmail.com. Right, people can deal with that. Also, um, the um, RT archive clip, um, I'll get that from you and I'll maybe post that out on the at LGBT History and I Twitter and Facebook um, in the next couple of days, anyhow, so people can ha have another opportunity to. Or Orla Kevney has just put it up there. Great, that's another. Um, uh, because obviously there's so much that people are not uh, aware of that um, they're beginning to learn tonight. Um, there is um, a question from from, from uh, Jude uh, who asks, um, what are your favourite or most effective ways for trans allies to show support now? Uh, <laughs> um, I, I suppose it, it's important that um you know to speak up for us but not to speak for us um to you know include trans people where possible in your activism or even in your social circles if they are looking to try um and join those circles um you know i think again like why i'd like to talk about trans history is the understanding that if you learn about this community and you learn about where we are. I mean, I, I spoke at one point where we say, I've always said, we've been kind of hanging on the coattails of the gay community for, you know, 100 years, up until about the mid 2000s when we start, and you'll see both, um, you know, a very different dynamic boat for both sides of the border, um, where you start seeing like the likes of Tenny and the likes of, you know, uh, Sale and the likes of, um, Gender Jam and a few of the trans Northern Ireland and all start to form, um, you know, in, in that period of time. But up to that point, we were very much centered in, in and depended upon and we're very thankful for the gay community, the LG, rest of the LGB community. So I think it's about being supportive, speaking for us where you hear negative views, but, you know, sorry, speaking in support of us, but not speaking for us, not speaking over us or think that you can speak for us. Um, but then these are these are normal everyday things that I think we would all, having gone through, you know, the LGBT community, assume you would not want somebody who is straight to talk for the community necessarily. Um, there's a question here from from Carol uh, Terrain, and they ask, um, you mentioned the Belfast. Away. Pardon? I said, go, go away. <laughs> so, uh, you mentioned the <laughs> Belfast woman. Um, that would be. Uh, Will McCreed, who travelled to Leeds for surgery. Yes. And Carol asked, would that have been a private treatment or was the NHS supporting trans health care at that point? Uh, no, at that point they weren't supporting trans health care. There was, there was, the NHS were starting to consider it, um, but at that stage it wasn't 100%. But the Leeds one was definitely private um, because that wasn't, it was they had, the uh, NHS has started through Charing Cross, as it is still today, for the majority of it, although there are other places in the UK now. Uh, I want to know that, that Karen McShane had her hand up. Karen, you had a question to ask again? It was more a follow-up point, Richard. Um, just just really looking at where we've got to today. I think, I think the trans history hasn't been completed by any means. There's a long way to go. Um, today, we sit with a four or five year waiting list to get into the gender identity clinic in Belfast. Um, and certainly, Sarah was talking there about self-identification. 
um, and perhaps that might be the way to go. Where we stand here today, um, it's very difficult to get in for a referral. Um, and my fear is that the suicide rate of some people will, will, will just increase as a result. So I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about your thoughts on the best way forward for identification, Sarah, and how we might get to the clinic a little bit quicker. Um, well, that, that is a, a, a $64 million question, Karen. I think um, we, we have a similar situation down here, and I know Noah Halpin is in here somewhere um, in this conversation. We are, you know, we are consistently fighting the gender clinic down here in Dublin. Um, it's currently at a three-year waiting list, maybe not as long as yours, but there is a currently a three-year waiting list. Um, but however, it's also very similar to your own. It is very much a uh, an old system, diagnosis system, uh, a system that was, even in Southern Ireland, it's probably, I, I would argue it, it even is worse now than it was when I went through it, you know, 16, 17 years ago. Um, because it's, it's actually, they've taken a retrograde step and it's more of something that was, probably written up in the 1970s and early 1980s. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that there's a huge body of work on both sides of the border, you know, to try and create openings for trans healthcare specifically. The, the issue around uh, self-ID, uh, self-determination is very much a legal one. One of the arguments for us to be able to get self-determination was to be able to decouple uh, the legal rights from the medical rights and it, I think that was why we were successful in being able to get one of the reasons we were successful in being able to get um, get uh, you know gender recognition uh, down here and we, we've got this ridiculous situation where we are one of the most progressive countries in the world for legal rights but yet we are actually similar to Northern Ireland one of the the worst in the world for healthcare. care um, you know and, and that that is uh, there are singular, in, singular individuals who are controlling those both those clinics, uh, and it is just disgraceful. Um, and and but we are working very hard to try and break that. Um, you know, in the background, we are working uh, both, as I say, with Noah, like we're with Tenny and Noah are working. This is me are working together at the moment. We are trying to break down. Um, those barriers and find other ways of trying to create a gender clinic here in Dublin that is is inclusive and works on. Ironically, the head of the gender clinic will tell you that it's based on an assessment, not a diagnosis, which is a very wide open assessment. In fact, they've kind of caught us because we wrote the assessment. But what they're what they are doing is, in reality, they are creating a diagnostic assessment from what they say is our assessment. And our assessment is a holistic thing around making sure that you've got all the support networks around you, that you're getting you know, your needs across the whole of um, your life um, you know, supported. But they are creating barriers by, by using them, by saying, oh, you know, a young trans person is not being supported by their parents, so we're not gonna let you transition because you might get thrown out of the house these are barriers they're putting up and that is not what was meant for it. And then also then they're trying to create this diagnostic understanding of, of uh, you know, of trans people rather than providing assessments about how are you, are you ready to take such a big step, medical step, which is what we all should be trying to do is support each other. But, um, but yeah. Sarah, there's, there's a, a few comments that go into chat, which I'd like to share with the audience. Yeah. Uh, one is from Siobhan Omani to, um, to say that uh, she's proud to see the majority of lesbians groups, those which she's been involved with anyway, have embraced an inclusive ethos for all women. And in her experience, including that of the Cork Pride Women's Night, transphobia in any shape or form is not tolerated. And she feels this is reflected in the Irish lesbian attitude towards the UK trans exclusive radical feminist movement. Um, also, I should say, I'm employed myself by an um, um, uh, organization here in I for Lesbian and by Women. And my observation is that um, it is um, inclusive and, and, um, uh, and em embraces trans. So 
their um, um, our observation on, on the situation in Ireland. Also, um, Noah Halpin had a hand up to maybe, maybe make a point or ask a question, Noah. If you want to Sorry, that, yourself. Sorry, that was just a little bit further back in something Sarah was saying about when a question came in there about the referral system, um, you know, in terms of the North and how they're not being essentially taken anymore. But I was just making the point that the, and I did put it in the chat, that it is kind of a similar system um, in terms of referrals happening North and South. However, the South are using kind of a different language to describe it, whereas they're saying they'll take the referral, but they're sending you a letter to say, okay, we've received it, but don't ask us when you're going to get an appointment. Don't ask us a time frame because we don't know. Um, so it, it's kind of essentially the same kind of situation that's happening and that, you know, no one knows when they're going to be seen or if they're going to be seen. But I was just making the point that it's a similar situation, but the language being used in terms of referrals to gender identity clinics or gender clinics um, is just a little bit more different. Thanks, Noah. I'll keep it a uh, question on the history. There's one here from Kim Walsh. Um, again, really appreciate your talk and um, just wants to ask, you mentioned there were very few visible trans men. And would you know why that was the case? And do you think that is changing in Ireland, UK now? Um, as to why it was the case, um, I, I'm not really sure, to be honest with you. I've spoken to a number of trans men who were around in the 90s uh, specifically, but, uh, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not aware of many in, in the 80s or the 70s, but um, in the... I do know of a number of them in the 90s and who very much transitioned, uh, had surgery and then, um, you know, moved on quietly into their lives. Now, many trans women did the same thing. You know, they weren't visible. They weren't out there. Many, many just went on about their lives. Um, why, why there weren't as many, I, I really don't know because it's very difficult to know. Um, you know, again, you don't see many trans men um, who transition older either, I don't think either for that matter, in, in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, has it changed? Yes, it's definitely changed. I mean, I think we very much reflect society now. We very much, uh, you know, there is that 50-50 kind of split nearly. Um, I, do, I do think though, back in kind of, you know, I, I know in my own time, you know, over the period between 92 and say 2002, those numbers were growing, like you, they were, you were seeing more and more of them. So the, to the fact that by, you know, 2005 and the Dublin Trans Peer Support Group was founded in Dublin, um, you know, it was very much a kind of 60-40 mix trans women to trans men, um, you know, for that first year. So the, the numbers had actually grown at that stage. I think also, you know, the internet provided a huge amount of information um, you know, at the latter part of the 90s and early 2000s, and that goes for all the whole trans community, you know, possibilities start to open up. People start to realize that they can live their lives in a way um, that kind of like suits them, suit them. I think there are a number of two, there's at least two friends of mine who would have identified, you know, uh, as Butch Dykes in the 90s, um, you know, who are now have transitioned and but but actually have stepped away from community completely and just living their lives out there as two men. Um, you know, I'm not sure really the answer as to why you don't see that kind of, especially in the 60s, 70s, because if you go back into history, if you go back into the early 19th, the 20th century and into the 19th century, there are an awful lot more trans men than there are trans women, which is interesting. Um, and I think I'm sure there's a social conversation there, you know, uh, a psychosocial conversation around, you know, what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman and, you know, the dynamic of the, the uh, patriarchy and stuff like that. I'm sure all of that feeds into uh, conversations about why people at some point in our history are comfortable to come out and more and more come out and then others don't in whether they're, you know, for arguments like why do, why have we now in the last 15 years seen quite a number of non-binary people come out, for instance, where people identifying using that language in the past 
would have just lived their lives and said nothing, probably. You know, so right. it's. I take one more question. Um, if someone wants to raise the hand or raise their voice. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a question actually, if there's uh, time. Um, just, you know, the way that you mentioned about how Friends of Eon chose not to join the Hirschfield Centre originally. Um, was there kind of a turning point where the trans community and the like lesbian and gay community started working together more? Or did it just kind of gradually happen in pockets? Um, it, it starts to happen um, in pockets throughout the 80s, um, but in very small pockets. Really where you start to see the change happening is the early 90s, and especially when decriminalization happens in uh, 1993. Um, I think the trans community then at that stage, if you look at when we talk about lesbian lives, if you look at the er those early 1990s era, you tend to find that those individuals like, you know, like Lydia Foy, like Anya Keenan, Denise Hurley, um, you know, Heather and Lauren, all of these individuals are, are living within the lesbian community. Uh, some of them in what's known as stealth, therefore they're not out, they're, they're presenting as female um, and, and don't want anybody to know they're trans. Others are very much out and very, uh, you know, very present in, in their, in their identity within those spaces. But it, it's very much around that start of the period of time and it starts to kind of, uh, people start to work together and they start to help. But it's, it's really the latter part of the 90s to a certain degree when money starts to come into it. <laughs> um, and um, you have to start looking at where it then, you have to be inclusive. So organizations are told, you know, the LGBT community and the T gets added on, and then all of a sudden, well, oh, hang on, we got to look around. We don't have any trans people here. So there's, there's, it, it's, it's a very slow. I think there's a, probably a better uh, history of that in in Northern Ireland, where you know a number of groups are connected uh, very much to the gay community at that stage. I think there's there's a lot more, you know, probably better links forged than there are specifically with in, in Southern Ireland. Thanks, and then again. Uh, you know. And um, it's great to have uh, some historians in the audience because historian Tom Hoom has reminded us that there's um, a literature on on um, trans men and he said um, there's a, a book um, by Jen Mannion and he's put this into the chat called Female Husbands, A Trans History. And one of the case studies is of John Coulter, a person assigned female who lived and married as a man in Belfast <coughs> many yes. years and became something of a cause celeb in 1884. So yep. thank you, Tom. And that's in the chat if anyone wants to look at the details. And if, if, anybody, if, if anybody wants, you can, you can also, I'll add in a few more names in there. You can have a look at Albert Cashier from Lock, Clockerhead in, in County Loud. Um, it's a, some great history on Albert. Uh, fought in the Union or in the Civil War in the, in the States on the Union side. Some great stories there. And there's quite a lot of, you know, um, stories around women, specifically women who uh, fought in the Union, uh, on the Union side in that war. But, but when the war is over, go back to being women. Where Albert doesn't, Albert lives out the rest of his life. If you want to check out Albert's story, you'll find lots of stuff on the internet. Another person you'll find lots of stuff is Edward de Lacey Evans. I'll, I'll type these in, probably is the best thing. Um, Barbara, while you're typing them in, I'll just make um, um, before I turn off the recording, I'd like us all to um, show either visually or audible appreciation for a wonderful talk by uh, Sarah Phillips. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> I've stuck.